All right. Um, well, I'd like to welcome you all here today um, to, I guess this is our third in our series um, so far. And um, also welcome whoever is on the internet <laughs> our live streaming this. So welcome um, to join And um, if you want to provide a speaker, please do so. Um, and so the rest of you here, you know that you are you will be videoed as you sit there, but uh, that's like okay. Um, so tonight our topic, let's see, let's see, this is a little bit. Just click in the middle. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm Jillian Perkins. I'm the medical director of the Equine and Nemo Farm and Animal Hospital. And um, I'll be organizing this um, series with Lindsay um, Dudeo and um, Sarah Bassman. So thank you guys for doing all the work and having our flyers up front. If you haven't signed in, please sign in. And um, I also wanted to put in a plug for our hospital tour that we're doing on the next um, second Tuesday of the month. So basically the hospital tour, we're going to set up multiple stations throughout the hospital for people to kind of rotate through and um, see the various things we do in the hospital, how we work with your referring veterinary, with your veterinary to provide care in the hospital. Um, looking at uh, endoscopy videos or um, uh, dental charts and skeletons and things like that. So we hope to be a very interactive tour and very active for you, the um, participants. Um, and in doing that, it requires a lot of people on our part to put it together. So we do request that people um, register in advance. There still is no charge to attend, but we do kind of need to know numbers so we can organize our time and number of stations. So the link to that is listed here on this page, or if you go on to our, you know, just Google our Cornell Equine Health Seminar, and you'll find that link um, on there as well. So, um, so we really are working hard to put that together for you guys, so I hope you can sign up and attend. Um, if it's a really bad weather day, which of course we all know can happen in February, um, so we will probably plan for like the week after. Um, and uh, hopefully that will work for people. So for tonight though, we're gonna talk to, about um, something very near to my heart, which is uh, caring for pregnant mares and the, when they're about to pull. And I'd like to introduce Mariana Gil Gilmore um, <laughs> to speak about that to you today. She's our reproductive yeah, specialist at the college and she'll give you a little bit of her background and then start on to um, there and, and what's best that you're expecting. So, so thanks, Mariana, for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you guys hear me well? Excellent. So, I am, uh, uh, like Dr. Brooklyn already said, I'm uh, Mariana Deal. Yeah, Warren. It's the longest <laughs> last name. You can look to Google longest last name in Cornell University. You get mine. Uh, <laughs> And anyway, so my background is I've done, uh, I graduated veterinary college back in Brazil. So I'm originally from Brazil. And then I moved to Canada and I did two internships. Um, and then I did a residency to become a specialist. And our specialty, uh, even though we normally call ourselves reproductive medicine, where our specialty is theoretic so we're called, uh, we're diplomats of the American College of Theoretologists, but pretty much reproductive medicine specialists. So what we deal is um, anything that has to do from getting animals pregnant uh, through the gestational time and then through maturation. So kind of like what we do by the end um, of the animal growth. So I've done um, most of my time I spent in Canada. I was about eight years there before I joined Cornell. Uh, so you know, not too far from here. Like University of Guelph was uh, not too far off. So kind of have a little bit of my heart still in Canada. Uh, but Cornell has grown a big part into me. So I'm uh, very very grateful to be here. Uh, and um, Anyways, I will start my lecture and then you guys feel free to interrupt or ask any questions you have along the way. So I thought that uh, from today we'll start by talking a little bit 
about recommended pregnancy check. So we read our mayor, uh, what is, what, what do we recommend as steroidologists? What is the guidelines, kind of what we use? Um, mention a little bit about fetal sexing, uh, and then we'll go on to the care of the pregnant horse, uh, how do we calculate due dates, and then how can we actually monitor those mares for fully? Because uh, in the end of it, if we're breeding a mare, what we really want with all the investments that we make in terms of money and emotional investment is that we have a healthy foal in the end of that gestation period. Um, and then I'll mention a little bit about foal care, um, just uh, kind of like the first few hours of birth. So you guys kind of um, get a little bit of a, a grasp on that. So this is just a funny cartoon for you guys. So my mare was bred, so what? You know, there was some um, mare romance there. And the way that we breed uh, horses nowadays became a little bit different. Of course, it depends on the industry that you work with. When you talk about thoroughbred industry, where there is no um, possibility to do artificial reproductive techniques, so like we can't do artificial inseminations and things like that, because the registry doesn't permit that, uh, then we're talking about natural cover. But in reality is, the, um, the reproduction part of the horse has uh, evoluted quite a bit. And nowadays, we send mares to be bred. They're bred with you know, either chilled semen that come in a box. So we call them the boyfriends that come in a box. Uh, and we tend to attach a picture of the sign, so we hope that the mare likes them. Uh, but they don't have a lot of choice on that mare. And some of them come in a big container, uh, which the semen has been frozen. And sometimes it's from signs that, that have been dead for quite a long time. So people invest a lot of uh, financial and emotional things into the breeding of the horse. So having said that, we bred the mare. So now it's time to crack check them. So in horses, we tend to recommend pregnancy check at about 14 days after ovulation. So of course, some people will be breeding horses, uh, and if they are in a pasture mating situation, which still happens, uh, they're probably not going to have either a veterinarian assigned to them. They're going to be doing ultrasound examinations, and then they will expose the mare to the scion, they pasture mate or the hen mate, uh, you know, taking the scion to the mare. And then once the mare doesn't uh, or rejects the scion after that, they will be doing their prank checks about 14 days later or 15 days later. So in cases that we don't have an actual ovulation date uh, for the mare, we tend to encourage a second recheck breeding uh, or ultrasound recheck. And the reason for that is sometimes the embryonic growth, so that embryo grows a little bit different in each mare, and we really don't want to miss twins in horses. So unlike other species, twins in horses is a very bad deal, um, so not a very good thing uh, to have. Now I'll mention a little bit. But this is an embryo, about uh, day eight embryo. Um, and this is how they look like on ultrasound when you take your horse for pregnancy check. Pretty much a little bubble. <laughs> so on ultrasound, um, anything that is fluid filled looks kind of anechoic, what we call it anechoic, but black on ultrasound. And if we have two of those guys, that means that mare has twins. And because twins is not a good thing, then we tend to have to deal with it a little bit earlier. So there is uh, a few uh, lines of certain breeds and some breeds as well, like thoroughbreds and warm bloods have a tendency to have double ovulation, so have higher rates of having twins. And some specific family lines uh, tend to always double ovulate or have twins, higher rates of twins. So let's say I have a mare, and I know she normally double ovulates or she has an incidence of having twins, the chances of her having twins again the next time I bring her is pretty high. So we tend to deal with that. And why are twins so bad in mares? Um, is because 
the mare's placenta is not really designed to carry two babies, so two foals don't really fit well there. Uh, she can't really um, nourish two, uh, two foals very well. So in this case, two is not better than one. Um, and the likelihood of both, both foals being born alive and surviving that first neonatal period is about one in 300,000. So pretty bad deal for us. So when we talk about breeding mares, we kind of have to know what's the investment. I bred the mare, I should do a credit check in case she does have twins. I can eliminate one and continue the other one to grow. Pretty easy things, a standard thing that we do it all the time. So all the ultrasound checks that we recommend, besides at 14 days, that is kind of really the key to be able to work with if you do have twins and horses, is a heartbeat check at about 25 days. And here is this demonstrating an ultrasound. You see kind of, this is the uterus of the bear, and this is the little foal, and you see the little heart is kind of this blue and red. So we want to make sure that that embryo is developing well. And just like in uh, humans, that um, our uh, woman gets pregnant, she goes in for her ultrasound check and then embryonic development and want to make sure that the baby is growing well. We can do all of those things in the horse. Uh, at day 35 of pregnancy, uh, the mares have something unique to their placenta. And before that, these days, there is a high rate of those embryos not surviving. Uh, so we tend to about 10 to 12, 20% of those pregnancies that ended up getting eliminated. Something didn't go well in the placentation, something that just didn't work out well. So for those reasons, we tend to recommend a day 35 check to make sure that the marriage is still pregnant and, you know, embryo is developing well. Other things that people recommend is um, most of the times we breed horses, they come in, they get pregnant, and then they go, and sometimes we don't see them again until the fall is out or if they come back to us for fall. But um, just like humans, we tend to recommend doing a later stand, so at fall time, since we breed them in the summertime, at fall time, we recommend doing a scan to make sure embryo is developing properly and making sure that there is no pathologies associated with placenta. Mares sometimes end up having some uh, problems of the placenta, and, and if we catch them early, if we can identify them early, a lot of the times we can treat them. If we catch those diseases <laughs> later on, it's much harder. Uh, you're kind of behind the, uh, the eight ball game there. So we tend to recommend that full pregnancy examination as well. And here is just a, just a video for you guys. Oh, yeah, I can play it again. If you play it once, that's it. Uh, if I go back there, will it play again? Nope. <laughs> So uh, this is just showing the heart is right here and normally uh, there is a nice heartbeat uh, and we just want to make sure the baby uh, has a decent heart rate and everything is fine. So before mares go for foaling or let's say you do fall uh, out on your property or you take your mare out for a foaling center to fold it out, it's important to determine uh, if the foal is coming head first or back first. Um, majority of mares will not have problems at parturition, but if they do have, and you know that there is some kind of chance that the foal is actually not in the correct position that they should be born in, so head first, uh, you, uh, you know, can think that this is a higher risk pregnancy, may want to think about having a mare in a facility that may be able to deal with like potential c-section if she needs one and things like that um, so we kind of tend to do a pre folding examination so if they come to fall with us uh, that's something that we always do before they fall to make sure that you know everything is lined up there is no problems we're trying to prevent and scan any problems that we may have in the future 
Some other optional ultrasound checks, uh, not something that we always do, but we do offer to clients. And sometimes um, we don't offer, but clients will ask for it because they're overexcited excited if it's he or she. Uh, is it a full or a filly? So we can do fetal sexing. Um, fetal sexing can only be done in two stages of gestation. And normally we do it early stage of the station or a bit later stage of the station. Um, and the reason why is because we have to look at the fetal parts of like boy or girl uh, and where they are. And because of the mare's abdomen is so large in later on in gestation, it's hard to find all the bits and parts that we actually need to look with ultrasound. So earlier in say, uh, gestation, the optimal time is at about 59 to 68 days of pregnancy. And we normally do a transrectal ultrasound, just like we do for a pregnancy check in a horse. And we find the fetus and we can look at, you know, those bits and parts and see where they're located. You know, does it have a uh, penis or does it have a vulva? What's gonna develop into a vulva? Uh, later on in gestation, about 100 to 260 days, that big uterus that snout that fetus is developing passes, kind of like drops down into the abdomen. And now at this point, we tend to do a transabdominal ultrasound and we can look for is it a full or a filly? So, what, what, what will it be? Um, the equine industry has not developed yet uh, those things to define, you know, the, the surprise parties, but maybe that would be a cool thing to do for horses. <laughs> well, my mare has a boy or a girl, and then you get blue balloons or, or pink balloons. Um, so, things that we've done all our preg checks, pregnancy is going well, we are not uh, worried, um, and now our main worry is make sure our normal care of our horse is, you know, what can I do with pregnant mares that I don't normally do with um, horses that are not pregnant. So routine dental care and food care uh, is as needed. So they should have their regular um, farrier work uh, throughout pregnancy. And, you know, of course, I tend to avoid too much stress. If it's a mare that is always stressed about getting their feet done, uh, then a little bit of sedation is totally fine in pregnancy, but we try to minimize a little bit. Uh, the routine dental care, we try to um, normally recommend uh, dental work to be done before we breed the mares. So the annual dental examinations, they should be done by a, a veterinarian. And then if they need to have any dental work, normally try to do it before breeding. If they haven't done before breeding, uh, a lot of the times can be done during breeding, but we tend to kind of really decrease the amount of stress that we put them under. And sometimes they, they need a little bit heavier sedation for certain dental procedures. So just like women, that we tend not to uh, have any dental procedures while we're pregnant, we tend to kind of recommend the same for pregnant horses. There are several vaccines, uh, including herpes virus vaccines that are recommended about five, seven, and nine months of pregnancy. Uh, normally, you should follow a veterinarian recommendation. Uh, there are AEP guidelines. The AEP is the American uh, Association for Equine Practitioners, and they have pretty good guidelines that we can follow. Uh, in general terms, pregnant mares should be kept in stable groups, meaning, let's say I have a farm and I have uh, you know, a couple of paddocks of horses, and you know, there's always a little bit of um, you know disagreement between the horses. They're trying to sort their packing order, uh, but we try to keep them in stable groups, so not moving around of a lot of pregnant mares from one group to the other all the time. And especially if you have horses that travel to show barns back and forth, try to minimize that contact with pregnant mares. So keeping those horses separated or the, the pregnant mares actually separated in their own group to avoid kind of stress. So horses that or pregnant mares are in constant stress uh, may end up having um, 
abortions, um, and herpes virus is a is a common cause of abortion. So minimizing the stress is really important. So feeding. <laughs> Uh, we get a lot of questions about feeding. Should uh, you know we increase uh, that amount of concentrated as soon as we diagnose those mares pregnant? And um, you know, if you go to any OBGYN, they probably will tell you that throughout your pregnancy, even though you're craving more food, you pretty, pretty much should be eating a regular diet uh, because you really don't need to be eating for two. Um, same thing for horse. Uh, we tend not to uh, to get too worried about overfeeding or feeding more of those mares or concentrated during the beginning of the pregnancy. So really, the full, the biggest full growth is in the last trimester. So from about eight months or so of pregnancy, they have a bigger growth, and that's you know then that supplementation of a good mare and full ratio uh, is. Um, it's a fair game. Um, you have to keep a constant, um, you know, assessing constantly the weight, the weight and body condition of those horses. Uh, the weight tape doesn't accurately reflect pregnant mares very well, so it's more important to kind of develop your own way to assess body condition. So about five to six out of nine body conditions, so not too fat, not too skinny is ideal and try to keep them uh, that body condition. And constant hay and water. So free hay and water uh, is very important for them. Horses tend to graze all the time. That's what nature intended them to do. So good quality hay is much, uh, it's more important than giving a lot of concentrated food. So majority of supplements, uh, especially the herbal types of supplements, have not been tested in pregnant mares. So we tend to kind of stay away. Uh, of course, that uh, mineral supplements like mineral blocks are important for horses. Uh, there is more evidence now that vitamin E, selenium uh, are deficient because our hay is deficient in, in, in selenium especially. So um, some people will keep them, um, you know, supplementing them with vitamin E selenium. There's different kinds and the absorption of each product is a little bit different. So if you have specific questions on nutrition, uh, it's not a bad idea to have a nutritionist that can help you balance the, the ratio for a pregnant mare. Uh, sometimes it can give very good insights. And exercise. Majority of the mares can keep a good, decent level of exercise through their whole pregnancy up to about eight months of pregnancy when they become quite heavy because their ears is just, you know, that fetus is now developing. So make sure that if you're exercising your pregnant mare, you're going to adapt her to her previous fitness level. If she's a pregnant mare that's kind of a couch potato and goes to the paddock and literally just graze and not walk around because that's what pregnant mares tend to do. They just stand in one little space and eat the hay and then take two steps and eat some more hay. Uh, then, you know, you can go in and lunge in the mare for 30 minutes. So just try to adapt to that kind of fitness. But there are lots of pregnant mares that you still race. There are pregnant mares that um, you still are being ridden, and that's okay. Uh, within the last few months of gestation, you probably want to taper down a little bit of the exercise. Um, but um, the last two months, like the last month or the two weeks before their due date, some mares uh, have a little bit before that. They develop lag edema quite frequently. And even the mares that are in paddocks outside, some mares are stable all the time, uh, so then they tend to develop more edema on the hind legs. But some mares, even when they go outside, like I said, they just stand around and don't fall cloth, they end up developing some leg edema. So hand walking them, um, if they have more leg edema or stable rats may help. So just keep an eye on how they're doing. So things uh, should I transport a mare to fall out in an outdoor facility? 
Uh, and the, 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 the answer is uh, you may, you may decide to pull them out at your property. Um, it's, uh, it's really of your comfort level of what you decide to do and your previous experience with falling. If you do decide to transport them to another facility for falling out, or if you decide to change barns because you want to fall out to a mare in a different barn, Normally, what we recommend is that you transport that horse about 15 to 30 days before her due date. And the reason for that is just to get the mares uh, like immunity and, and immunoglobulin kind of like, um, or immunity level uh, uh, accustomed to those uh, local pathogenic organisms into that new place so she can pass it on to the foal. So normally, that's the recommendation guideline. So when, when she has the foal, those antibodies can be passed on to that new, new foal through her colostrum. So not challenging them with anything that it's much newer if she goes to a facility, you know, much, very close to falling time. So what do I need to prepare my mare before falling, you know, close to her falling time? Um, sometimes we tend to forget that they have a back end so if they're sued up in the back, so if they have a coslet, uh, some areas that are a bit older uh, tend to have, uh, have their vulva uh, sutured. So if they have a coslet, we have to open those coslet that month prior to falling. Um, if we don't open the coslet and the mare tends to fall, they will pretty much leave the coslet, the sutures that you put it in place intact, and they will make another hole on the other side of her vulva. They, it seems incredible what they can do. So we really make sure that we want to kind of look at that back end. Uh, memory secretions, does she have any memory secretion or, or, or that memory gland is it starting to develop that month before falling or not? Because if they start developing memory secretion on milk uh, much earlier, that's not a good sign. So anything that is before 300 days that have a big uh, memory gland development or is dripping milk is a bad sign and really needs a bad workup. Okay, so uh, this is a sign that pregnancy has some kind of pathology that either the foe is under stress or the placenta is not being able to, um, you know, to really keep that foe inside of that uterus and needs, you know, full needs that uterus until it's fully ready to come out. So, what is the gestational length in the horse? You know, what is the true gestational length? So, we say about 340 days. So, this is what we always use for our calculations, and we say average about 340 days from ovulation timing. Reality is Every mare is a little bit different, um, and the range can go from 320 to more than 365 days. And we get a lot of the times questions from owners about mares that have a prolonged gestational period. If they are in an area that we don't worry about uh, fescue grass or anything like that, then no big deal. Uh, longer gestational uh, lengths are okay as long as there is no pathology associated with it. Um, it's not a bad idea to check the mare just to make sure everything is fine, uh, but in general, they have quite a long range. So if you are having a hard time calculating 340 days from the time your mare was bred or ovulated, there are online calculators like Google calendar calculators that you can just say, today was the day she was bred, add 340 days and then it pops up the exact due date for the mare. Uh, or you can just google mare due date calculator and you find multiple uh, calculators available. So 300, there are lots of mares that will fall, normal foals at 320 days, but foals that are normally born before 320 days Normally, we are worried about prematurity, so they're preemies, um, and in general, they have lower survival rate. Uh, there are a few of them um, that may be a little 
bit uh, lower than 320 and they do okay, but in general they have a low survival rate. So um, we tend to be careful about those guys. So what things can affect the gestational age in the mare? So there are lots of things like season, day length, is it a cold or a filly? And is the mare a first time maiden? Yes, she was bred, um, so she's technically not a virgin, but this is her first foal carry, so we still call them maiden mares. Or has she had multiple foals before? So in general, uh, the length of pregnancy is usually about at least five to 10 days longer in fall in mares that fall late winter or early spring than if they kind of fall in the summer or late spring. So the day length, uh, the amount of light really influenced to making the gestational length a little bit shorter. Um, mares tend to carry, um, you know, uh, boys a little bit longer. They need a little bit more time to cook. And maiden mares tend to have a little bit longer gestational uh, uh, length. So knowing all those things, there is so much variability in the gestational length in the mare. Uh, and you know, why do we actually bother attending foaling or monitoring those mares for foaling? So the reason why is that problems at birthing, or we call them dystocia, is not a common thing in the horse. You know, compared to a cow, for example, they have much higher rates of dystocias. But when they do happen in horses, because they have a very explosive and short period of putting that fall out to the actual parturition of falling event is very short in the mare. When they do happen, uh, there are, they can be train wrecks. The equine placenta also detaches quite uh, fast um, and extended labors, uh, the foals rarely survive. So that is why we tend to be more intensively monitoring those mares. So this is just a graph for you guys to see uh, the number of foals here and the time of the foals. So the majority of the mares, as you can see, 83% of them will fall at night versus the 17% of them that fall uh, during the day. So it's really an intensive work of spending the nights awakened, praying for this mare to just like, please, just, just fall. I would like to go to sleep at some point. So, uh, but in reality is, of course, you're expecting that in 83% of the time, those mares are gonna fall at night, but they literally can fall at any time. So I always say mares are trying to be sneaky. In reality is, uh, they're prey animals. Uh, what they want is to be able to fall uh, when everything's safe and there is no one around. So if you spend all the nights awakened in a barn at night waiting for that mare to fall, the moment that you stack your food outside to go to the bathroom, uh, she will spit out that fall in about five seconds. <laughs> or in the middle of the night storm. Or in the middle of an end storm, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so there is one, uh, the last slide of this lecture, I will put it up for you guys to read, and it's the mayor code of honor. <laughs> it's very interesting. <laughs> so, um, so what are things that can help us determine <laughs> when the mares are actually getting ready for falling? Like, how can I predict in a few days when she's actually getting ready for falling? So, um, is the mare less than 330 days of gestation? Um, we tend to look at them if they come in on a daily basis, about 320 days of gestation on, and we want to monitor uh, the back end of the horse. So we look at the vulva, we look at the memory glands, and we want to see how enlarged those memory glands are and how the teeth are. Sometimes the memory gland enlarges, they develop some edema, but the teeth don't, um, they're not filled yet. So we want to, you know, just see the progression of every day. What happens if she's more than 400 days of gestation? Yeah, so you probably at least time will be, uh, you know, really uh, exercising 
your, um, uh, I would say, um, patience with this horse and hope that no, no bad words come out of your mouth. <laughs> uh, but uh, there are reported pregnancies uh, of normal uh, pregnancies that are over 100 days of gestation. The foals uh, that have a very long, abnormally long gestational age tend to be smaller foals and may have some issues, um, but we don't tend to induce horses for parturition like we do with uh, women uh, if they're not ready. There are several criteria that we can use, but if we induce a foal that is not ready to be born, that can be disastrous consequences. Uh, you know, both for the foal and the mom. So we kind of tend to keep an eye on them. So does she have colostrum in the other? So that colostrum is that, you know, kind of preparatory uh, phase of that memory secretion that is going to be ingested by the foal and that is going to be full of immunoglobulins to give that uh, passive immunity to the foal that he, really, he or she really needs. And looking at the back end, does her drug uh, seems more relaxed, uh, you know, how is her ligaments, how is her tail, does it, you know, is she all tight like she was, does she look <laughs> like equal gait or not. So those are things that we would be checking horses for on a daily basis. The problem with that is um, <laughs> there is a lot of variability of when do they develop an, an other, right, when do they have like the perennial uh, relaxation when their vulva starts to relax. So as you can see here, it's quite variable. It can, variable, uh, can be variable from like six weeks to three weeks. The teeth can be large for about a week. Uh, they normally uh, start to wax the teeth, so they have a little bit of like that waxing, so the colostrum kind of gets very sticky at the tip of the teeth at about one to three days before parturition. And so that's when we kind of like know they're getting close. But it's so variable, so when can we tell and really start checking the mares? So we look at all of those things, right? The other girl, how full it is, it is distended, is it waxing, is it leaking? Uh, but there are other things that we look at. And the biggest problem is, you guys can't see these, these very well, but these is like two little olives. <laughs> it's uh, two little teeth. So the other thing is sometimes they uh, grow that memory gland, but sometimes they don't at all. And they fall out and they have just suddenly, it's like magic. It just shows up and the milk starts ripping up as soon as they have the fall. Uh, so male and mares, so mares that never went through the uh, problem of uh, the parturition tend to do that quite often. They're very sneaky and unreliable horses to really like follow them for parturition. So here's a few more examples of teeth that are uh, filled. And you can see here that boxing on the tip of the teeth. So how can I assess memory secretions for readiness for folding? Because I said, you know, the elongation of the vulva is variable. Uh, some mares will develop some memory glands. Some mares will not develop any memory gland. Some will fill out their teeth, some won't. So how can I truly trust and not stay awake for like two, like a month straight or three weeks straight, watching this mare night and day in hope that I can catch this falling or magical falling? So uh, there are several ways that we can measure, um, and it's, there is not one single technique that can tell you in 100% of the time when the mare is gonna, gonna fall, but uh, we can predict in a more narrow or a few days, in about three days or so, when they will really gonna fall. So um, we can do daily measurements of uh, pH or calcium, or we can do both. Um, so kind of reduces that number of nights awakened, which pretty much if you've done a few falling of mares, that's what we really want. So what you want to do is you clean the teeth um, and you use a glove hand and attempt a little bit of expression of that memory secretion from the teeth. Um, and you try to do that every day. Um, until they have something to give to you. 
Uh, what we want to look for is the color and consistency of that memory secretion. However, there is some variation. Uh, again, they really just want to be able to fall and on their own and make sure that you stay awake. So um, earlier on, they tend to have a sharp color and they have a more watery consistency. But as they're approaching falling, that it turns later into a yellowish or sometimes even whitish secretion, just like milk, and it becomes quite sticky from the amount of blood shows they have. Again, maiden bears, watch out for them. They can do anything. Um, but um, you can take a notepad and you can make daily notes of your memory secretion measurements. So with pH, uh, you only require literally about a drop or two. So it works really well, especially for mares that you don't have a lot of memory gland, gland development and a lot of secretion. Uh, and it's commercially available. You can literally buy on Amazon. Um, and this uh, brand has been researched before, seems to work. Uh, and there are electronic pHs. Uh, that you can use. So people that uh, do a lot of aquarium, uh, they always have to constantly check the pH of their water to make sure that the fish are living in their conditions that they need. So uh, these also can be used, those aquarium pHs there. Fairly accurate if you can use solutions uh, to make sure that they're stable, they have nice uh, guidelines that you can follow. The biggest problem with the pH is that the studies vary on the cutoff value. Is it a 7 pH or is it a 6.8 or is it a 6.4 pH that I should use? And from this time on, I should keep on calling this mare or not. Majority of the studies indicate that anything that is below 7 pH is a good indication that she's getting close and she should be monitored overnight, okay, or during the day. Um, some mares, they tend to have that, you know, 8 pH or 7.8, and then they have that constant, but then they, from one day to the next, they tend to drop that pH quite fast to about a, let's say, 6.4, and it was an 8 before. So that mare, there is a very high chance that she'll fall that night. So we watch for those ones that have a very sudden drop in the pH. Other things that we can use, like I said, is the calcium. Um, previously, we used to send a lot of the measurements of electrolytes, calcium in the memory secretion to the lab. If this is still done, you can do it through your vet. Uh, but a lot of the times nowadays that are commercial kits, they're not, um, they're kind of like relative values, uh, but they do work. So there is this, um, this one is a Merck one, is Chemetrix uh, is the name of the company uh, that sells that. It's a total hardness water test. And what you have to do is you have to buy distilled water from the supermarket, mix one ml of memory secretion with five parts of distilled water. And then you mix this solution and you dip this strip and you can literally count how many of them turn from green to pink. When those squares become, all four, score, all four squares become pink, there is a 70% chance that the majority of those mares will fall the next, this coming next three days. Yes. Do you, so I see you said you dilute it, you dilute this one, you don't dilute the pH. No, okay. the pH is one or two drops on the pH. The problem is with the digital pH is that you need a little bit more secretion. And the biggest problem with that is because there is some variability on your mare population. It's important to test a few mares and see what works for you because maybe the 7 may be a 6.8 or maybe a 6.5. So I would say whatever you work, let's say you, you uh, use calcium or a full watch test, which I'm going to mention right now, um, I would pair up with what you're currently uh, comfortable with, pair up your pH and see what is your trend throughout your mares and see if that helps you. 
some guidelines. So uh, the other task is this fall watch, and I do not work from any of these companies, but I've done research with that. Um, and we work with those tasks because they're commercially available tasks um, for monitoring layers, because like I said, we do like to watch the phonies, but we don't, you know, we do also like to have some sanity and a little bit of sleep, even if it's just a little bit. Uh, so this is a commercial calcium factorization task. Uh, it's a little bit more accurate in terms of the factorization task. Uh, the only problem with this is uh, very, very easy clean instructions, but it, it requires 1.5 ml of memory secretion. So it doesn't seem like a lot, but for a maiden mayor, it's, uh, it's quite a bit. Okay. So sometimes the 1.5 you can get quite a bit, but sometimes you're literally like sweating it out every day to get 1.5 ml of memory secretion. So they're very easy instructions uh, to kind of perform this task, but pretty much uh, they have these little factorization kits uh, that you mix uh, the 1.5 ml of the memory secretion with about 9 ml of uh, distilled water that they provide for you. And then you put one drop of an indicator, that is that, this purple thing here, and then you mix it together and you use these device, this saturation kit, to kind of suck it up, this mixed solution. And when it turns from kind of a, uh, it's not only kind of orangey color to this blue color, you tilt it around and you can read what is the level of calcium that you have. So if they have higher levels of calcium in the memory secretion, that means they're getting closer to home. So when they hit about 200 uh, parts per million of calcium, which you're gonna read right here, um, there is a 51% chance that they're gonna fall within 24 hours, but a 97% chance of falling within 72. So that means you pretty much said that, you know, you may be awake for three nights, but it's not gonna be for three weeks. <laughs> so. It's a great test. We use it all the time. And now I'm going to show you a little bit of the research uh, that we've done just comparing those technologies. But um, is there any other test? So people have used bricks, uh, which measures the specific gravity or like the sugar content of those memory secretions. And they determined that about 22%, uh, when you, you put a drop of memory secretion here, and you close this little device and then you read it off the scale. It's very simple and easy uh, to use. Uh, people that make beer and wine use, uh, use those devices. Uh, so, you know, it's uh, when you measure 22%, then they figure out that this is when within the next few days the man is going to fall. So it's not a very sensitive test, about 50% accurate only for about three days, so not great. But what is important is that um, it assesses the quality of the colostrum. So mares that have a 22% on a pre scale, that means they have good, decent colostrum, and we don't normally tend to worry so much about the falls. If she has a very low volume of breaks, then we're worried that we may have to give plasma to the foals or supplement the foals uh, with other or better quality colostrum. So because of that, uh, we also know that male mares tend to have higher volumes of breaks and, you know, multiple male mares that had many foals before sometimes drip milk and it seems that they have you know, not as a good colostrum as some women bears may have. So this is just to show you the different technologies and how sensitive it is. So that full watch or factorization uh, task is about 80% chance based on our study. So very similar to what is reported by the commercial kits, what, what they report, uh, that the mares will fall within three days. Uh, the milk test strip, you know, that one that you count the, the, the squares from turning to green to pink, is only about 71%. And then the pH digital and pH strip is about 55 and 65. 
So what is more important is they actually what they're able to predict better is when the bears are likely not to fall. So you can test the mares and say, well, they're likely not to fall today. So at least they can have more night's sleep and you know, maybe wake up in the middle of the night, check the mares and things like that, but you don't, you know, have a you you don't have a completely uninterrupted sleep. Uh, so 92% chance using the full watch tip test, but look at the pH digital, about 83% chance. So when we look at both of them combined, when they combine the full watch and a pH type of technology, either the strip of paper or the aquarium type of scenario, we increase our ability to about 90% or 91% within those like last three days. So recommendation here is if you're falling out mares yourself, I probably would combine those technologies um, so you have a little bit more like, you know, sensitivity and specificity. So that's kind of going to help you out. But having said that, some mares don't follow the rules. So watch out for maiden mares. They tend to be sneaky. Uh, and sometimes they will fall with a pH of 7.6 or 8. So those mares, we tend to keep a very close eye on. So how can we overcome those things? We can overcome those things by uh, adding other equipment, uh, such as video surveillance, uh, you know, fully made reality TV uh, that we all get hooked on, and we are like watching 24 seven. Um, and other things like Fuller, there is a device, again, I don't work for the company, but these are the commercial products that are available uh, for us. Uh, you attach this device to the mobile of the mare and has a little magnet. And once the fall, uh, the falling starts, that magnet disconnects from this uh, transponder, and it emits a signal uh, that sends kind of a radio signal that calls out a cell phone. And then we get a phone call saying, "A mare is falling. A mare is falling." So we all head out to the barn. So, and the reason why is because, you know, the mega mares that may be sneaky or during the day, you're feeding hay to the horses or something. Uh, these would be technologies that will help you pick up those mares that may be missed by memory situations. So, talking about falling, since that's what we're talking about, <laughs> uh, we have that first stage, which is the preparatory uh, uh, phase, which I call it the just kidding phase. Uh, why I call it just kidding phase? Because mares will walk around, watch their flying, call, and show that they're getting ready to have a fall. And then they're like, uh, no, just kidding. So, this phase normally finish when the mare actually breaks her water. Uh, so then we call it, God, it was about time. Uh, this phase normally can last from 30 minutes to six hours and really depends on the mare. But sometimes they'll sweat profusely um, and they look kind of uncomfortable, kind of colicky signs. The second stage is the actual falling stage or fetal expulsion. And this is the part that we always worry about because that's the very fast, explosive efforts that the mare will have. So a lot of the times she will lay down. And as you can see, she was very smart and lay down just against the wall. Uh, so in those cases, we ended up going in and intervening and then you see she'll grant and she'll have these contractions and then she's trying to pass that fall. The important part in this phase, majority of the times goes smoothly. What you want to look for is make sure there is two feet in the nose. And you see that those feet are a little bit too back. So in this case, normally, uh, they should be not close together. They should have a little bit of a difference there, but when they're uh, one is like very much back. Sometimes they have a little bit of a shoulder lock, so we kind of tend to examine those horses and if they needed help, we would intervene. 
So this man here, she took a little bit longer, so we ended up coming in and examining. It wasn't a big deal, but it was slightly shorter log, so we kind of helped just correct and pull the fall out very gently, and no major issues. But in reality, the majority of them are fairly fast and easy. So stage three is what we call it the afterbirth membrane expulsion. So mares pass the fall, now they have to pass the placenta. So if they pass the fall, that doesn't mean you can go to sleep. It just means you have a little bit more work. <laughs> so they pass the fall, you have to check the fall, make sure that they're fine, and then she has to pass the placenta and the fall has to nurse before you can say, oh, potentially I could go take a little nap before I can come in and check on them again. Um, but the idea is um, within less than three hours, they should be passing that placenta. And if they don't, by three hours, then you're calling the veterinarian to come in and examine the mare. Uh, we tend to kind of offer, after falling, a brand match for them, you know, just kind of help them out a little bit. Um, you don't have to, but that's what we tend to do. Uh, they're, they're pretty excited about getting a brand match after falling. And if this is just wishful thinking that they will fall a little bit faster. <laughs> so, big rules of uh, rules of falling are one, two, and three. So, fall should stand within one hour after parturition. You should nurse within about two hours, and then again, the mare should pass her after birth within three hours. So, and again, like I said, do we actually, you know, go to sleep? No, we have to make sure the little guy is able to nurse. So as you can see here, uh, this mare has a little bit of the placenta hanging out. She's a first time mom, so she's kind of nibbling on him a little bit harder. So he's kind of like losing a little bit of his balance, but he's trying to figure out to find those memory glands and figure out, um, you know, where he needs to go. So some foals will learn faster than others, uh, you know, and you know, the thing that we do have to make sure is when they are born, can they go to the right side of the mare and the left side and suckle and find, find those memory lines from both sides? Is he not a dummy foal? So we just have to make sure he has normal mentation and the normal physiological things that we look for in foals. So, um, you know, we watch for the foal, make sure to see if the foal can latch on both feet. And do you hear the foal actually suckling? Can you hear that suckling sound? So the other thing to look for is after a good suckle, does that foal look like he's satisfied? Does he go and lay down and then take a snooze until the next time, until the next hour when he stands up again and go on his own and is able to find that memory line? Um, you know, and the other thing to look for is after he suckles, is that memory gland less turgid? Is she drinking milk still or she's, she seems that it's a little bit, you know, less full? So those things are things to look for to make sure that he's actually ingesting some of that colostrum and nursing well. So um, this is what we want to hear. And this is a big teeth. I'm sorry. She has huge humongous teeth that go up to like. But you can see the foal is really trying hard to find. Just newborn foal. And if you hear close enough, you can hear a little bit of the suckling. Maybe not. <laughs> but he did suckle. <laughs> and we did measure uh, that he was, you know, drinking well enough. So we did. 24 hours, let's say, if always nursing, everything looks like, you know, the normal timeline, one to three rules of foley. If always nursing well, Mary's doing well, remember, it's not about the foal only, it's also about the mare. We have to make sure that she's okay. You know, she's not hemorrhaging, she's eating well, and she's drinking, and everything's fine. 
we tend to call the veterinarian um, then the following day, about 12 to 18 hours before he's born. We want to make sure uh, the mare gets a post polling exam. Uh, we want to examine that placenta. Majority of the people that fall out, lots of mares are able uh, or should be able to learn how to examine the placenta yourself, make sure that there is no rips and everything's intact. If you're not sure, save that placenta in a bag uh, for your veterinarian to have a look. Um, it's kind of important because uh, sometimes if there is a miss, missing piece of the placenta that can cause serious problems for the horse, and the mare can get quite sick from having a piece of placenta back inside her ears still. So we tend to kind of address that a little bit faster. Uh, and then the other thing that we tend to do is take blood from the foal to make sure uh, that he now has enough passive immunity. Uh, so you can send the, the blood to the lab uh, to measure IgG concentrations or immunoglobulins, or a uh, majority of veterinarians will also use a snap pass uh, that is, can be done at the barn very fairly fast, and then we can see if that, you know, what is the levels of IgG? So foals that didn't drink enough colostrum and didn't reach a certain level of IgG, we tend to recommend them to have plasma transfusions to make sure that they are covered and then they don't end up coming to the hospital in a more intensive care unit. We like to see them, but we prefer that they're healthy. So when should I call the vet? Um, any failure to progress into labor, so if the mare is circling and just the kidney phase, but really not progressing into labor and you think there is something wrong, just call. Um, people are always happy to give advice or come and examine the mare. If the water actually broke and she started push, pushing and having contractions uh, and it has been more than 20 minutes, half an hour, and the foal is not out yet, you definitely should call your veterinarian. Okay. If you see hind legs of the foal, call them. If you see front, front legs but no head, definitely call them because you're going to need some help and also make sure you call the neighbors. Um, and this is called a red bag. So sometimes um, the mares can have a separation of the placenta. The foal should be able to rupture that and start coming out. But if it doesn't rupture, and you see these, what we call the red bag from the vulva of the mare and no foal is coming out. This is a medical emergency. You should call your vet immediately and they're probably going to tell you that you're going to have to help deliver this foal. Okay, so this is something just to watch out for. Uh, not extremely common, but it does happen once in a while. So we do have to deal with this. Um, the foals that tend to be born from red bags end up knitting if they survive, but a lot of the times they don't. But if they survive, they end up needing neonatal intensive care. And then, any of the prolongations of the rules of foaling? In the past, the placenta, the mare is not doing so well, uh, you know, things like that should call you back. If you're worried about foaling your mare yourself, um, there are lots of facilities available that can help you uh, and close to your area, but we do have Equine, Cornell Equine Park, and we offer foaling. It's a beautiful uh, facility. And this is just, since I'm here, that means other people are working, so I can be here speaking with you guys. Uh, so I wanted to kind of give a thank to our, our reproductive medicine team. This is Dr. Chong, our section chief, uh, this is Sarah Ruby, uh, she's our tech, uh, technician. Uh, Dr. Rosenberg is a first year resident, and then myself here, and Dr. Mitchell, uh, our second year resident. So, the great team, if you guys have any questions ever, you can give us a call, and I'll be happy to take any questions, but I will also leave the mayor's photo owner. It's very long to read, but it's quite funny. Point about the hearing the folds 
sucking a little bit is oh, you always, still always want to see them on the teeth because they can suck on other things than the teeth. <laughs> and you really want to be able to see them on the teeth and sucking at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a great point. Because mm -hmm. they will suckle on the walls and lines of course right. <laughs> or anything else they can find, especially if they're not extremely smart. Which sometimes they're not as in a fair level. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, I have no plan for sleep or anything like that or around anyone. But her pony there produces milk. So the first time you noticed it, it was like panic time. It was like eleven dollars. Yeah. After we purchased her, <laughs> <laughs> you're at like a speed show, and all of a sudden there's milk dripping all over the place. Like, yeah. Holy cow! Oh no! What's going on? Um. But I was just curious, like, could she nurse there a bit, like a full, like, or would her milk not be good enough quality? Um, I have no plans for that, but it's always like, you know, yeah. Like, what, what if? It is? So we tend not to. Normally, nurse mares uh, can be there are different ways to have nurse mares, uh, but we tend to have nurse mares who can chemically induce them, but the quality is not exactly the same as naturally nurse mares. She tends to have milk just about all year round. Yeah, I haven't checked lately because the vet like just leave it alone and I don't really monitor. Yeah, and sometimes they get, you know, first thing that we always say is like, make sure she's not pregnant. She's definitely not pregnant if she's lactating all the way around <laughs> and every year. Uh, but we, we tend then sometimes some mares will lactate and we tend not to kind of worry so much. There are metabolic diseases that sometimes uh, you could test for, but if she's otherwise pretty healthy, I wouldn't worry so much. The biggest problem as well with like nursing mares, right? Like fostering foals, it's a big time commitment. Um, the maternal bond between the mare and the newborn foal is a big deal. So mares that didn't go through actual parturition uh, is, is a very hard thing to do. We definitely can do it. There are drugs that can be used, but it's, it's a little bit of a traumatic event. And of course, in those things, when we have no option, like, you know, a foal was born and unfortunately the mare died, then we can definitely find nurse mares and, you know, foster foals, but we always prefer if we don't have to do it, right? The healthy horse is always better. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, any suggestions for the mare who says, I don't know what this is, but I don't like it and rejects the foal? <laughs> Cross Atlantic. <laughs> so we have pretty good success with high dose of cross Atlantic. Um, it's a fairly high dose and they tend to call it. Uh, so that's the reason I said there are side effects to it. Um, but the cross Atlantic works quite well. And I can't remember the right dose right in the top of my head, but I believe it's like five mouths of little Of little it's like, the, it's like the cows dose for a horse, which we tend not to use these high dose in horses. So crossing London works very well. People have had a good experience like massaging the cervix and other things, but the crossing London seems to be in favor and have been having quite a bit of success. Any other questions? I'd also say if you're planning to have a foal for your first time, you may or may not want your veterinarian present at the time of delivery or all those sort of things. It's, it's always gauged on how your experience is as well. But we have some people in the room here that have, you know, 10 to 15 mares that pull out each year that are very comfortable. But if it's your first time, you want to be working with your vet early on to make some plans or and to go over this discussion again. <laughs> it's also time consuming and mm -hmm. to be quite honest, a lot of people prefer not to have to do that work because it's a lot of nights and weekends. Um, any investment, right? What kinds of things would you recommend for a full kit? For a full kit? Um, so you definitely should have clamps um, for umbilical clamps just in case. They, 
if normal parturition, you know, the regular mare lays down, foal is born, and then she stands up, she tends to clamp that umbilical, and there is some hemiostasis there. So I don't don't have to worry so much about that. But it's good idea to have lots of towels. Very important to have lots of towels. Um, we tend to have so because we work in a foaling facility and you know we're vets, but you know if you do your own foaling, you definitely should have some chains and obstetric um, handles because you know um, you don't have to put a lot of force to pull a foal out. Um, but if you do have to pull one because everything is slippery, then having chains is easier. And then maybe, like you probably know how to put chains very well, but for people that don't know, putting chains is, a, is an important thing to make sure you put them correctly, because if you don't loop the chains correctly above and below the fat lock, you can literally break the legs of the pole. So having that knowledge. So that's why Dr. Perkins is saying, like, you know, if you're pulling out a mare for the first time, it's kind of a, a major thing if you haven't had experience. So trying to either get this experience of, or the peace of mind of having the mare full at a facility is kind of important. Um, but yeah, we set your chains, lots of loop, as you know, uh, water buckets, <laughs> um, and another gastric tube and a funnel to kind of help you if you do need to loop things out in a more kind of gallons of loop type of thing <laughs> to help you. So that's, I think that's kind of your basic folding kit that you need. And some scissors and things. Yes. Now with rabbits, um, you can't. You have to breed them before they're a year old. Is that like kind of the same with a horse? Do you no. So yeah. So in in um, in horses, we tend not to breed them until they're three years of age because mares are below three years of age. They tend to have higher uh, chances of not carrying that pregnancy than they are losing that pregnancy. So we tend not to breed them until they're at least three. And a lot of the times when we breed horses a little bit later is because like the mares have like a career. Um, you know, they're either race horses or uh, they were in a jump competition and then they have a name and a pedigree behind and then now they want to, you know, keep that progeny and those foals carrying on their name and pedigree. But like, um, my dad was, can, are they like not fertile if they're not bred at a certain time? Like, um, no, they're they're mares that can they can breed later on in life. They tend not to be fertile if they're too young. So we don't we don't worry so much about breeding a bit older mares. We don't want too old. It's like having a baby for the first time when you're like much much older. But we don't have a problem of having a specific certain age. Definitely not the thirty year old horse. But um, so we do make some miracles. Well, do you have a, a sort of a ballpark figure on what it would, would cost to bring a, a, a mare to the filling facility here? You know, you bring them in early, what, 15 to 30 so, days before? I mean, you, you're, there are a lot of things you'll be doing. Yes. This <clears throat> brochure just uh, covers. Uh, board now there's a lot of that actually includes our fees oh it does yeah include okay so ballpark you should be more yeah <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? uh ballpark we say if they're about for about the month here we about we say about eighteen hundred dollars without complications if there are complications we have to call owners and ask for permission and things like that mm -hmm. but it's between fifteen hundred to eighteen hundred depends on you know, sometimes they come in a month before, but then they fall in a bit earlier, or sometimes they come in close to falling time, but then they take their time. So we have a fee that is associated with the amount of days that they stay. So the longer they stay, the fee decreases per day. Uh, so we kind of make a deal, a package that if you stay for like three days versus a week versus a month, your know, daily like board fee actually decreases. So eighteen hundred, you're looking at everything. If they need extra, you know, full needs plasma, 
or you know extra care then it's a different story but just regular following for us to monitor and spend our nights awake and watching the camera and taking every secretion that's on for the capacity ballpark mm -hmm. yeah. yes, so a red bag is an emergency and you want to fall out in 20 minutes and your bed is apt to be more than 20 minutes away what can the owner do so at this time uh, if you have never dealt with a red bag try to get a hold of your owner of your veterinarian to talk to them over the phone so they can you know describe the procedure but pretty much if it's a red bag what i would tell you is um get something sharp to cut that red bag open and pull that pull out and and the reason why we tend not to tell you to do medical things but it is a life and death emergency and we don't want to say don't deal with it until we get there just be cautious right the mare will be under stress if you have worked with horses before and you have a good comfort level just dive in and take that pull out that's the most important thing okay don't cut your fingers. Don't cut your fingers. <laughs> and it is very scary to do because I remember the first time I ever saw one, it didn't look as perfect as that. Mm -hmm. So um, so it is very scary. So well um it's getting kind of late. We uh, thanks everybody for their questions and discussion. If you have more questions for us individually, please feel free to stay back. Um thank you very much thank for you. your wonderful lecture. <laughs>